I want to thank uh, the praise team this morning filling in for Annie and Brad. They are on a well-deserved vacation today, so if you'll keep them in, in your prayers, and uh, what a wonderful job our praise team always does. I want to thank Darren for uh, standing in for us. I heard it was a tremendous message out. Amen. And I, I love some of the exercises he had you doing at the very end. Those, that was good. Amen. Darren is always going to do something that stirs, stirs you up, that's for sure. Today we're talking about church discipline. How many are thrilled about hearing about church discipline? Let me see your hand. Okay. I, well, <laughs> uh, it's in the Bible, and uh, it's the next chapter, so uh, I didn't just pull it out. But uh, I thought to kind of, uh, you know, put, us in a, put you in a better mood about church discipline, I, I would give you some examples of folks who kind of went a little bit overboard with uh, disciplining. Listen to this. While patrolling the streets of his small town, a new policeman gave a citation for every infraction he could find. When a car came rushing by, he immediately turned on his siren and lights and pulled over the driver. The young man jumped from his car and tried to explain his emergency, but the, the officer perceived the verbal initiative as a threat, so he cuffed the man and hauled him off to jail. Every time the guy tried to speak, Luke, this uh, uh, officer, exercised his authority and insisted on silence. After making the arrest and feeling confident he had demonstrated the complete power of his badge, Luke started an autocratic monologue with his prisoner. He smugly said, lucky for you, fly boy, the chief is at his daughter's wedding and he will be in a good mood when he finally gets here to see you. The prisoner replied, I wouldn't count on it, Barney. I'm the groom. <laughs> So be careful when you, with your discipline. Um, I love this. A little girl said to her teacher, Miss Hayes, I don't want to scare you, but my dad said if my grades don't improve, someone's going to get a spanking. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Now that I've got you laughing, let's talk about this uh, serious but needful subject of church discipline. Now, Many of you, the minute I said that, church discipline, you said, what? You know, and that's because today's church has drifted so far from God's original intent that uh, it would hardly be recognized by the apostles who founded it. In many ways, church has become a theatrical event where people attend services expecting to be entertained, inspired, and encouraged without having to get involved in the messy affairs of church membership. Some people want the benefits of God's church without the requirement of church membership. And very few are willing to make genuine commitments to the church family. In fact, most don't consider the church to be a family. You ever thought about that? Most see the church as more of a country club where the only obligation of membership is the payment of a fee. And once the fee is paid, members are given access to a, an abundance of services and activities. Beloved, as long as people view the church as either a theater or a country club, they will never understand the, the, the validity of or the need for church discipline. But the church is not a theater. The church is not a country club. Listen carefully. The church is a family. The church is a family. Now turn to your neighbor and say, you're in my family. Yeah. And I'm in your family. Now for some of you, that's comforting. For some of you, that's not. Family has not been the greatest experience for you, perhaps. But the church is a family. And loving, listen, just as in all families, loving discipline is necessary. Whether we realize it or not, God intends for the members of a local church to be accountable to each other. And we are to look out for any behavior that would be a bad reflection upon our Lord, our Father, and the family. 
So let's see what Paul says about church discipline. If you'll take your outlines this morning, the first thing we want to see this morning is when is church discipline necessary? When is church discipline necessary? And you might want to write this down. It's always necessary when a member is living in open, rebellious, unrepentant sin. Open, rebellious, unrepentant sin. Now, the Bible tells us, by the way, exactly how to go about church discipline. And many people don't follow the rules, and that's why a lot of churches get in trouble. I'll never forget before Becky and I uh, were called here. We uh, were pastoring in Nashville, and one of the last headlines I saw in the newspapers there was a a headline that read about a lady who was suing uh, her church. And when I read about how they were going about church discipline, my heart broke. They had taken everything public. They had shamed her before everybody. The steps that the Bible tells you to use, they skipped the first two or three and went right to the last one. And no wonder uh, they were in trouble. This lady was horribly embarrassed, unnecessarily embarrassed, and it did not have to be that way. The Bible makes it clear to us that the first step whenever someone is involved in something they shouldn't be involved in is for one individual to go to that individual, listen, privately. Privately. You don't go around and tell other members yet. You don't broadcast it to others. If you know of a brother or sister that is involved in in behavior that's not becoming to being a Christian, could hurt the church, hurt the gospel of Jesus Christ, the witness of the Lord, then you should go to that person yourself. Yourself. Now that means this, by the way, that means that by going to that person yourself, it doesn't mean that you get on the phone and talk to 15 people on the way there and broadcast that news. You know, it's amazing today how that we are so accepting of of, uh, things that are not true. Uh, Becky and I were standing in a supermarket line the other day, and I looked at her, and I said, I said, guess what I saw the other day in one of these lines? And she said, what's that? I said, here was one article that said, Brad and Angelina divorced. He is angry over the uh, not being able to have the kids. Right next to it was another magazine that said, Brad and Angelita, the divorce is off. (laughs) Same month, same month's issue. Somebody's lying, amen? And so, listen, that should definitely never happen in the church of Jesus Christ. Your duty as a brother or sister in Christ, when you see somebody that you listen, that you love, who's wandered off the path, you go to them yourself. And you don't call 15 people on the way there and share what you're about to do. And you don't go around telling the story. You go to that person yourself. That's loving discipline. That's the way it happens. Look at Matthew chapter 18. Christ makes it so, so obvious here. Chap- Mat- uh, Matthew 18, 15 through 17, he says, If your brother sins against you. Now, by the way, this one here is if it's towards you. Uh, Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Would you circle that? If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear you, now here's where you take somebody else. If after you have appealed to him about the injury that he's done to you and he doesn't respond, he's still rebellious, he's he's still unrepentant, then you go get, listen, how many? You go get one more. You go get one more. Or two. One or two. Notice what he says. Take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, then and only then do you tell it to the entire church. You go through these stages. If you can go to the person by yourself and they repent, nobody else needs to know. Did you hear me? What I said this morning, nobody else needs to know. If you see your brother doing something that hurts you especially, but if it's going to hurt the cause of Christ, hurt the church, you go to them yourself alone and you tell nobody else. If they hear you, it's over. You don't have to tell anybody. If they won't hear you, you take one or two more with you. And once again, those two, including you, the three of you, if they hear you, 
Once again, it's over, and you tell nobody else. But if they won't hear you, and they won't repent, then you bring it to the church. And I believe that when we talk here about the church, we're talking here about the, the governing party in the church, the deacon board, and they handle the situation from there. That's how we, we do it in our day. And then notice what it says. If he refuses to even hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector, or that's just a, a poetic way of saying an unbeliever. Treat him like an unbeliever. So if, you, if this person has been approached by at least three different church members and refuses to repent and cease the, the sin and, and the, the entire church has to be informed, usually by a declaration by the deacon board, and church discipline must begin. Look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 2. Here is a very extreme reason for church discipline. Notice this. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. Now, did you catch that? I want you to notice four things about this man's sin. First of all, it was well known. It was well known. Everybody knew about it. This had been discussed throughout the community. It was not a secret sin. It was well known. Remember what I said a moment ago? If this is a, an open, open rebellious sin, it was well known. Number two, it was a repulsive sin. This sin, if you didn't catch it here, was sexual immorality with this person's, with this person's father's wife. Now, many, many commentators say probably what was going on here was this. This was probably his stepmother. It probably wasn't his mother because it, if it had been his mother, it would have said his mother. It says his father's wife. And so that, that, that indicates here that this is probably, he had probably remarried. Maybe, the, maybe this young man's mother had died and, and his father had remarried. And most commentators say, and probably a younger woman he had married. And so the son was attracted to her. But there was, and he became involved with her. And there was no indication that he was ashamed or intended to end the relationship. So this was a repulsive sin. And Paul says, even the Gentiles, even the evil Gentiles, they're in Corinth. And Corinth was, no, we, we told you about this, Corinth was like Vegas. Anything went. And Paul said, even in a city where anything goes, they don't do this. Isn't that amazing? So it was well known. It was a repulsive sin. Number three, it was continuous. It wasn't just temporary infatuation. He didn't go to his men's group and say, guys, pray for me. I'm infatuated with my father's wife, and I, and I'm, I feel bad about this. He should have done that, but he didn't. It wasn't just a temporary infatuation. He developed a relationship with his father's wife, and he continued to have a sexual relationship with her and was not ashamed, and there was no intention to end the relationship. So it was well known, it was a repulsive sin, it was continuous, and then number four, here is the most egregious. This is the, this is the most horrible thing about this situation. Look what it says. The Corinthian church was proud of their tolerance. They were tolerating this sin, and listen, not only were they tolerating it, but they weren't ashamed of it. Now, folks, before you gasp at these people, can I remind us of something that's going on in our nation today? Egregious, horrible, unspeakable sins are being committed today, and instead of people being ashamed, they're proud of it. For the first time since I've been a, a, a citizen of America, we are living in an age where things that are horrible that have never even been spoken of before are being done and we're not ashamed of it. We're proud of it. Proud of it. And we talk about, what, what, what's the byword today? The, the only thing that you can do today that will cause somebody to get mad at you is to be what? Intolerant. 
In fact, the only thing that you are allowed to be intolerant of today is Christians. Have you noticed that? That's why I chose this book when I wanted to deal with issues, our issues that we're facing today, because the Corinthians were doing the same thing. Not only were they allowing this sin, they were proud of it. They were proud of it. And here's, remember how, if you've been with us all these weeks moving up to this, if you'll remember, Paul rebuked them because they were judging Paul. They were telling Paul that, he, you know, that they didn't necessarily follow him anymore. Some of them were following Apollos now. Some of them were following Simon Peter. And some of them were so holy that they only followed Christ. And they weren't listening to any apostles. And so they were judging all these other people. They were judging these good men of God, these preachers of the Word of God, and yet tolerating this egregious sin. They were hypocritical and they were blind to their own sin. Look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. Your glorying is not good. Well, that's an understatement, isn't it? Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you are truly unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Did you notice what Paul's saying here? He's saying, he's saying when you guys get together for the Lord's Supper, you're, you hate each other. You're mad at each other. There's malice everywhere. There's division in the church. And then you're allowing these egregious sins. Don't you see that you are the very Lord's Supper that you're taking, that you are breaking, you're offending, you're making a, a mockery out of it. Can't you see that? That's what Paul's saying here. Paul's saying to allow this couple to continue the way they are would tempt others to commit sin without any fear of consequence. And boy, we have that today. The boldness in which people are practicing certain things is unbelievable. Listen to what Chuck Swindoll says about this. He said, I quote, The church had succumbed to a false teaching about grace that is growing fast in our own day. Some believe that once a person is justified before God and saved freely apart from any good works, that person may then do whatever is desirable because saving grace covers everything. End of quote. Well, let's see what Paul says about that. Grace is wonderful. We just sang about it. And, and if, if you're here this morning, you've never accepted Christ as your Savior. I don't care what you've done. Grace will forgive you. God's grace will forgive you. But from that moment on, your attitude is to be what Romans 6, 1 through 2 says. Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. Some translations say, God forbid. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? And so Paul, did you notice something here? Paul uses the Passover as an example of what to do in cases of church discipline. Did you catch that? He uses the Passover. What, what do you mean by that, preacher? What, what, why is this an example? He says to, notice the quote here, purge out the old leaven that we may be a new lump. In other words, you're, you are to do everything possible to keep the influences of the old life out of your own experience. Now, however, now listen carefully to this. This is important that you catch this and you get the balance here. You are to do everything you can to keep those influences out of your life so that you don't slip back yourself. But the answer in keeping yourself pure is not secrecy. It's not secrecy. And it's not denial. But it's rather, as the Bible talks so often, sincerity and truth. Once again... That's why I love our CCR program so much. In that room, every single time they meet, they have sincerity and truth. Those people know they can come into that room and they can confess their struggles. They can talk about the fact, I'm, I'm struggling with this, I'm struggling with that. And they can name it no matter how horrible it may sound. And no one rejects them. They are received as long as they're there to be better. Amen. 
That loudest amen was Stan Gatton. I know you know that. So, <laughs> Folks, the church ought to be the place that you can tell anybody anything amen. and still be accepted as long as you are wanting to walk away from that thing. If you want help, they're there to help. But you, don't, you shouldn't be embarrassed. You're only as sick as your secrets, I hear them say. And one of, the, one of the greatest lies Satan tells in the church is, well, you shouldn't tell folks that you're struggling with anything. Then who are you going to tell? We are family. You should be able to tell your brothers and sisters anything as long as you're wanting help. But now if you're, if you're boasting about what you're doing and you don't have any intention of, of stopping it, then you have to be disciplined. That's what exactly what Paul is saying here. We should be able to share temptations and failures without being rejected in the church. And I want you to notice something here. Isn't this amazing? Paul did not rebuke this young man for being tempted. Now, this is even more amazing. He's not even suggesting discipline for this fellow falling into sin. No, he's rebuking him for not seeking forgiveness for his sin. Rebuking the church. He's rebuking the young man for not forsaking his sin, and he's rebuking the church for not, listen to me, caring enough to point out the man's sin and for not bringing him to accountability. For whatever reason, the Corinthians here were actually supporting this guy and promoting it and boasting about it. And you know something? This whole scenario that we're reading about here in 1 Corinthians 5 could have been avoided if the church had only heeded James chapter 5, verse 16. Look at this. Confess your faults to one another and pray for one another. If the church in Corinth had been practicing that, if this young man had come to a group in church, to his church family and said, I have fallen. I've done this horrible thing. I've had an affair with my, with my, my father's bride. Help me. The whole thing could have been over. He would have not been judged. He would have not been, had to have been disciplined. He judged himself. And he was able to, and he shared. Isn't it amazing, though? I'm talking to some of you now, and, and the very thought that you would share a struggle that you have with anybody else makes you tremble. It shouldn't. Isn't it amazing how Satan has, has told so many lies and has given such a wrong impression of the church that he has literally caused the church to fail to do what she was called to do? What a horrible commentary on the church of Jesus Christ. God gave us the church. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. If the church was doing what it ought to do, and if people really understood the value of, of what takes place in, in a church that is practicing this thing of discipline and love and restoration, you would not need half of the pills and the, and the, and the counselors and the psychiatrists that we have today. <laughs> Confess your faults to one another. And pray for one another. And so, what's our first point here? When is church discipline necessary? When somebody is involved in open, rebellious, unrepentant sin. Number two, how should church discipline be administered? And this is where so many churches go wrong. So many churches will wait until this thing gets totally out of line, and then when they do respond, they respond in an aggressive, unloving way. And so church discipline gets a bad name. But look what Paul says that church discipline is supposed to be like. Chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. For I indeed is absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present, him who has so done this deed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. You say, man, that sounds pretty rough. They're handing this guy over to Satan. Here's what that means. Paul's saying you're going to have to remove, listen, you're going to have to remove him 
from your fellowship, from the church's protection, from the church's security. You're going to have to thrust him out there where he says he wants to be anyway. He wants to keep doing this, this horrible sin. He, won't, he will not listen to you and will not listen to your, your guidance and instruction. So you thrust him out there to where he is full force faced with Satan's consequences. Remove the brother, Paul is saying, from the privileges and the protection of the church to the realm of Satan where he will reap the consequences of his sin and unfortunately, in some cases, maybe even lose his life. This man will not lose his salvation. Can I hear an amen? amen? He will not lose his salvation because of his sin, but he may lose his privilege to continue in this life if he doesn't repent and return to the Lord. Look at verse 5 again that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Being removed from the privilege of the church includes being banned from all the privileges of membership. Let's, let's look at all that this in, includes. His name's taken off the church roll, if you will. He's removed from all forms of Christian service. He's not allowed to continue to serve, and he's forbidden fellowship. Once again, who is this guy? He's an open rebellious, unrepentant sin. You say, boy, this seems awfully extreme. Well, what he's doing is awfully extreme. He's dragging the name of the church and the, and the name of Jesus Christ through the mud. Notice, if you will, verses 9 through 11 of chapter 5. Paul says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. Paul's saying, I'm not saying you can't go to lunch with a lost person. I'm not saying you can't work around a lost person. I'm not saying you can't live around a lost person. Paul said you'd have to leave the planet to get away from everybody. You can't do that. Paul says, that's not what I'm talking about. Here's who he's talking about. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother or sister who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. You need to make it known to that brother or that sister, this is not acceptable. I love you, but this is not acceptable. No, I can't go to lunch with you because I cannot condone what you're doing. I'm not going to be a part of what you're doing. I want you to know something here, too. I, I, I can't leave this verse without pointing this out. Would you look at the, let's, let's leave that, that uh, middle part of this verse. Um, well, no, let's look at the last part. He says, a brother who is sexually immoral... Now, we don't have any problem with uh, saying we should judge that, right? But now look at this one. Sex or, or covetous. I, read a, uh, I haven't read this book yet, but I saw a trailer for a book a, a few years ago. It was, it was called Acceptable Sins. And it was talking about sins that the church accepts. And it talks about how though we have no problem judging sexual immorality, but somebody that's being covetous? Think about that. Uh, look at this, or an idolater, or a reviler, somebody that's always stirring up trouble, a, a drunkard, or an extortioner, somebody who's stealing funds, cheating to get funds. Well, we've, we have drifted so far from the truth of God's Word, haven't we? But I want you to notice what Paul says here. How, do you, how are you to treat this guy? Are you to hate him? Of course not. Are you, are you to be mean to him? No. You treat him as a heathen, and the word there literally means an unbeliever. Let me ask you a question. Can unbelievers attend church services? Well, of course. So this fellow can keep coming to church services. Of course he can. In fact, he should come to church services and keep hearing about the love of God and the forgiveness of God and the grace that we sing about. Can I hear an amen? Now, see, I know some churches where... where Throwing them out of the church means that they have, they have these guys standing at the door, and when the person tries to come back, you're not allowed in church. What? <laughs> Drug addicts, murderers, they're allowed, but you're not. Isn't that amazing? No, it just simply means that you strip him of everything that says I'm a church member. He's taking off the church role, can't serve in any ministries, and he can't hang out with the fellowship of believers. 
He has to get the point that he's done something wrong. When your child is acting up, I don't care how young they are, what do you do? You know, nowadays this is so popular, you send them to the corner away from everybody else. Am I right? And that's what they're doing here. They're sending this, folk, this guy to the corner. He's, he's no longer allowed to play because he doesn't play nice. Church discipline. Some of you are sitting there going, I have never heard anything like this before. I know. I know. That's because we're living in an age now where so many in the church believe that, well, you can take this part of the Word of God, but, you know, I don't know about the rest. Every Word of God is true. And it's to be obeyed. And good for me, it would just happen to be the next chapter. So you can't say I'm picking on you. Um, this fellow can still attend church services because even unbelievers are allowed to do that, but there can be no close fellowship. I love what Dr. Um, Tony Evans says about this. He says, church is like a hospital. It's where people who are sick, broken, bruised, beaten, and battered with life because of sin and unrighteousness come for help. It's okay if you're here and don't have all your life together. If you had all your life together, you wouldn't need to be here. Can I hear an amen? All right. How many of you here have, have your life totally together? Everything is perfect. It's fine. Okay, so there's nobody we can come to and ask advice for you on that, can we? However, hosp listen carefully. However, hospitals do not tolerate sick people hanging around who don't want to get better. And all the nurses said. <laughs> That's great. No doctor is going to keep fooling with a patient who won't take his medicine or won't accept a needle but wants to occupy a room. What would you think if someone said, look, I know I'm sick. I've decided to stay sick because I just like this hospital. I'm going to put my name on the door to this room and live here for a while. You would condemn such a person for a misuse of the hospital because a hospital only exists to give life. That is what the church does. Just as people are born and go to a hospital to get equipped to live, you are born again to come into the church. And everybody said, Amen. We've lost, we have lost an understanding of what the church is. And we're failing to obey a good portion of what Christ said to obey. And then we wonder why church members struggle so much and have such a hard time following Christ in our day. Number three, what is the main purpose of church discipline? And if you don't get anything else today, please get this. Chuck Swindoll says this, and I quote, Paul commands the church to lovingly correct not vindictively punish members who persist in, sin, in sinning. Once a change of mind and heart is gained, con congregations should welcome home with open, should welcome the person home with open arms. And everybody said. In fact, if you'll, if you'll go ahead and skip on over to 2 Corinthians, you'll see where this, this church, bless their heart, the word balance never uh, came into their mind because once they get this letter from Paul and they decide to do the right thing then they, they, they send the fellow on his way he begins to feel the heat from Satan he's, law, he's, he's out from under the protection he's missing the fellowship and he comes back listen and he repents and what does the church do? They open up their arms and say, oh, way to go, young man. That's wonderful. No. They say, that ain't enough. You got to do something else. We're just going to keep the pressure on until we make sure that you've... Isn't that amazing? They went from one extreme to the other. And I've seen churches where they, where they go from one extreme to the other. One, in some churches, they just allow everything. Some churches, they preach against it, but they don't make, take any action on anything. And then there are those that when they take action, they got to tell the entire world. They got to keep, keep the thumb over this guy. They got to keep beating him on the head. We're going to make sure that you mean it.
Paul had to write them in 2 Corinthians and say, come on, the guy repented. Let up. Let up. He did what you wanted. He did what God wanted. Let him, leave him alone. Unreal. And this is why, they, by the way, this is why so many churches stay away from church discipline. Because unless you have the right people who are administering this and administering it in the right way, oh my, it can get so much out of hand. Now, the purpose of church discipline is to restore a brother or sister to fellowship with God and the church. Look at Galatians 6.1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, beat up on. Is that what it says? Condemn. Shame. No. Restore such a one in the spirit of what? Gentleness. Considering yourself lest you also be tempted. Think about that. Discipline should never be harsh or cruel or vindictive. The goal of discipline is restoration, not exclusion. But if a brother or sister will not repent and turn back to God, it leaves the church with no alternative but to exclude them from the fellowship. Now, I want you to notice something here. Paul makes it clear that this that he is talking about involves only the family of God. We are not to pass judgment on the lost. Now, folks, I think it's fine, of course, when a pastor gets up and he will point out something that's happening in society to point out that that's not what we should be doing. But sometimes I, I get a little grieved that preachers that are always picking on the lost. Folks, can I give you a clue? How do you expect the lost to act? Huh? Lost, they should act like lost people, Bill, right? Amen. <laughs> How should you expect those who don't know Christ to act? They should act like those who, who take advantage of everything the world has to offer and follow their flesh and live accordingly. We should pray for those that are lost. We should grieve over those that are lost. And we should point out when they're doing something wrong, but you're picking on the wrong person. <laughs> a giraffe's going to act like a giraffe. And so on. I'm not saying giraffes are bad. <laughs> Unless they try to eat your hair or something when you're at the zoo or something. But we're not to pass judgment on the lost. Listen, we're to leave that to God. Look at chapter 5, verses 12 to 13. For what have I to do with judging those also who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Did you catch that? Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. Folks, I just want to close by saying this. We're family. We're family. And we're to take care of each other. And we're to watch over each other in such a way. Listen. Now, by the way, here's the balance here. I would dare to say that a church probably doesn't have the right to uh, exert discipline if you haven't at the same time through the ages been exerting compassion and love. In the same way that we should take responsibility over our brothers and sisters in Christ to rebuke them and try to change them when they're doing wrong, we should also look out for their well-being, period. We should be contacting them when they're, when they're ill. We should be going to them and trying to, our best to meet their needs. That's why we have some of the ministries we have here in the church. But we need to all be careful about making sure that we are aware of those that are hurting and, and do our best. And it's not just the staff and the pastors that's responsible for that. Every one of us is. We're to look out for each other. I want you just to look around for a minute. When was the last time you, you called that person that's at two or three rows over or, or, or went up to them before the service started and said, I just want you to know I'm thinking about you. I'm so glad to see you. It's a blessing to, to see you still coming to church and, and being in the family. Is everything okay? That's another reason why some folks get so angry when the church tries to exert discipline. It's as if, I, I even heard someone say this, the only time they cared about me is when I did something wrong. 
Never heard from one of them until I did something wrong. Never got a phone call until I did something wrong. No one ever approached me. No one prayed with me until I did something wrong. Yeah. Church discipline is to restore, not condemn. And church discipline ought to be the, the natural outflowing of a bunch of hearts that love God and love each other. Do you let your children just do what they want to do? And do you, do you brag about it when they're breaking your heart? Do you go around puffed up and, and touting all the horrible... Do you brag about it? Or do you do your best in love after you've nurtured them all these years, after you've loved them, sacrificed, given, and given, and done without, and, and put yourself in harm's way for their good... Then when they do wrong, you go to them lovingly and compassionately, and you beg them, come back, come back. The church is no different. You see, the church isn't a country club. It's not a theater. I went on a website this week and listened to some of the podcasts of a pastor out of Canada. I'd never heard of this guy before, but he pastors a huge church up there. And they have several locations, and he was just talking about how that we've, that we've just gotten so far off of this thing, that we have gotten so far away from, from caring for one another. And he was talking about how that in this day, one of the, one of the greatest misunderstandings that we have is, is we have, because of the way we do church, we've given people the idea that the church is a theater, and you come, and you simply are entertained, inspired, and then, and you pay your fee, you put in your tithe, you pay your fee, and so when you need to use some rooms or you need some services, then, hey, you paid your fee, so this is my country club, this is my, my theater, this is where I go for entertainment, this is where I go for, for uh, what I need something. And he says, we've given people the wrong impression. We haven't told them we haven't made it clear to them, you're my brother, you're my sister. We're a family. And we care about more than you just being in attendance. I love what he said about millennials. And I, with all the problems that millennials have today and all the things that they face, I love what he said about them. He said, one thing about millennials, and I like this. If you're a millennial here today, God bless you. I, I'm, I'm glad that you have this in your in your social DNA. He says, millennials can see through f fakes easily. And they can tell it when all a church is trying to do is to get you to fill a pew, get you to fill up the room, get you to, to just come and attend and listen to a sermon. He said, no, millennials want to be challenged. And they don't want any fluff. They want to cut to the chase. They want to hear the truth. And then, listen, I love this. He said, and millennials are dogged about this. Don't tell them about something they should be doing without showing them how to do it and expecting them to go out and do it. He, and he gave an example. He said, look at, all, look at all the efforts around the world now to get clean water to people in places that don't have clean water. He said, behind nearly every one of those efforts is a group of millennials. They don't want to hear about what they ought to do. They want to know what they should be doing. And when they know it and you tell them how to do it, they'll do it. As a pastor, I'm excited about that. I'm excited about that. And I'm so sad that in our country, we've grown up with this attitude that church is a theater. You come once a week, you listen, you get a little inspired, you take away some truths that you use in your home, but the rest of the week, why, you don't even know who those people are. And challenges, that's for the pastors and missionaries and deacons. We're a family, and the family ought to know that they're appreciated and cared for and held accountable. So 
What do we need to know? We need to know when discipline is necessary. And it's necessary when somebody in the, in the congregation is, is living in open, unrepentant, rebellious sin. We should know how to discipline correctly with compassion and love. And we should know the main purpose behind church discipline. Not to condemn, not to beat up, not to embarrass, but to restore. To restore. If your child has done something wrong, your, your intention is not to embarrass or beat them up. It's to restore them, to just simply bring them back to where they need to be. If you're a loving parent, that's, that's what you do. Let's bow for prayer. Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus, forgive me, Father, as a pastor for the times that I haven't made it clear that what we're here for and what we're all about, we're a family. We're a family. Oh, Father, I just pray, God, you'll speak to hearts today. I pray that everyone under the sound of my voice this morning would, would say in their hearts, Lord, help me to be more aware of the people around me. Help me to, to step out of my comfort zone and go over and shake somebody's hand that I don't know and get to know them and help me to do as much as I have the time to do and the ability to do to get to know as many members of Open Door Baptist Church as I possibly can. And help me to hold them responsible and them accountable and help them to hold me responsible and accountable. And if I've gone so far, dear Lord, that I'm in open, rebellious, continual sin, help me to have the guts and the comfort and the faith in knowing I can go to CCR or I can go to the men's group or I can go to the ladies Bible study or I can go with any I can find somebody here and, and have an accountability partner who calls me on the phone prays with me and gives a rip and cares enough to call me out when I need to be called out oh, Father forgive us for playing church for having a semblance of godliness but denying the power of it. For coming in on Sundays and getting our ticket punched and leaving to just do what we want to do. Oh, Father, forgive us. Lord, speak to all of our hearts today. I believe with all of my heart we're in the very, very last days. It's time to quit playing. Lord, I know. Forgive us. Forgive us. We repent. We ask you, God, to restore us to what we need to be. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Let's stand together.